Hi, everyone. Welcome to Foresight Space Group. Super excited to have Creon here, and Creon will be interviewing Joe Mascaro. Joe, we've talked a little bit before about all the things that you'll be discussing. They are space focused and then very wide ranging. So I'm super excited for what we're about to get into. Creon, please take it away. I'll be in the chat monitoring questions. Thank you so, so much all for joining. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we have a small but distinguished group here and uh, tell your friends so that we can have a larger and even more distinguished group in the future. Uh, I, Joe, do you have uh, stuff prepared for this? I do. Although, uh, Creon, I was hoping to not use any slides. I think it would be a uh more enjoyable exercise for all of us but i i have some visuals if necessary um okay so do you want to do this q a style or do you want to just start pontificating would love to do a q a style but um i can also introduce the topic a little bit if that makes sense uh i'd rather try and get i'd rather introduce you and then Sounds we can good. move into the topics so um joe and i have worked together at planet labs for many years and we've been friends and he's actually been in this glorious room uh, that is my background with me uh, on at least one occasion, maybe more, and I think more. And um, uh, but um, Joe and I come from very different uh, paths, and so Joe, perhaps you could say a little bit about how you wound up at Planet, when that was, and what you did like before, and then what you pivoted to doing once you were at Planet Labs. Sure. Happy to, Creon. Um, and thank you all. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and I've really been looking forward to this. So um, I self-identify as an ecologist. Um, I got really interested in ecology and particularly tropical rainforest ecology when I was a kid. Um, it's noteworthy that at the same time I was interested in space. Um, my mother is a retired elementary school teacher. And in 1986, she was literally the same age as Krista McAuliffe, uh, who perished on Challenger. So I have a vivid memory of my mother sort of confiding in her colleagues after that. And that was my first, that's my first memory of thinking about space. Um, so I sort of, I really pursued this ecology career with vigor by the end of high school. I was already doing field work, and in college, I pretty much took field science courses all over the world, studied tropical jungles. Joe, did, weren't yeah. you doing field work in your own backyard? <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, so I did a couple of projects. One was uh, when I was quite young, like 10, I was growing bean plants like like Mendel uh modifying them and I, I actually my dad was teaching me about experimental design in minnesota was, if i'm not mistaken this was michigan southern michigan sorry and so uh he recommended that i experiment with putting certain beans in the freezer for different times and putting some in the microwave for different times to see which ones survived and grew and measure them and short story is they can they can survive five or so seconds in a microwave but not 30. Um, and they can survive indefinitely, as I could tell, at the age of 10 in the freezer. Um, and then later on, right at, right at the beginning of college, Creon, I, I started a forest restoration project uh, in my parents' yard. Um, so there's a lot of grass. It's Like Michigan. an official forest restoration project, or did you just call it? <laughs> I called it, my brother called it the plot, um, but it was... Uh, yeah, it was a patch of very shady grass that just wouldn't grow. Um, my dad is a big landscaping guru. So he was tired of planting grass there. And I was like, it's under under some big maple trees, like some canopy maple trees. But I thought, let's try to turn this back into a forest. So I started transplanting seedlings all over the place. And now it's uh, it's quite a thriving secondary forest. There's a couple of trees, 30 centimeter diameter in there. This will get to space eventually. But we're gonna we're gonna go to space from Earth, and um, uh, is space more like a freezer or a microwave, Joe? Whoa, what a question! I guess it's <laughs> Creon. Yeah, I mean, sort of. you know, we have a, we definitely have a microwave to freezer and more temperature differential in the sunless right. side to the dark side of the Earth, right? Yep, yep, we do. Okay, so let's keep going. So you you went on an ecology path, and then did you uh, did you uh, do that uh, major in college? And did you go to grad school? I did. I graduated with a bachelor in ecology. I want to mention at this point, I at this point was the first reintroduction to thinking about space as a scientist. 
It was the book Rare Earth by Peter Ward and David Brownlee, which was published in 1996 that got me kind of reinvigorated and, and hooked, um, which is ironic because that book was published, I think, a few months or a year before the, the first successful detection of an extrasolar planet um, in roughly 96. I might have the dates a little bit off. Um, but that book is quite a ecological tour of the history of the Earth and some of the consequences of things like, you know, the moon's influence on the Earth's rotation and things like that. And so I, I got to really say, interested in, oh yeah, go ahead. Need to interrupt. When Joe makes a book recommendation, take heed. He's, <laughs> he's gifted me more than one book, which have all had great um, impact on my life. Uh, cool It by Bjorn Lomberg on climate change and um, uh, uh, what was that? Um, vital what, question. Vital question by Nick Lane on the origins of life. Yeah. So, so rare earth is, is, is next on the list. Okay. Good to know. Keep going. So, uh, so, you know, ecology for those of you that don't study it, um, is a very retrospective discipline, at least at the time that I was learning it, by which I mean, you're constantly looking over your shoulder to the past at what we consider pristine or natural ecosystems. And you're sort of slugging around, sledging around, feeling miserable about the state of modern ecosystems. And I was riveted by the, the space people who have touched the ecology universe. So I read about Biosphere 2. I read about Verdnasky. Um, and I, I noticed that space thinking was very prospective is the word I would use in terms of ecology. And a, a person that you all know, uh, Chris McKay, is one of the few people that really crosses both of these words as worlds as a practicing scientist. Yeah, we're going to get Chris, we're going to get Chris up on stage here. We're just working out the details. I'm sure you will. So, um, but just, I was delighted by his work. So I guess, you know, I was sort of constantly focused on becoming an ecologist. But uh, along the way, I ran into remote sensing, um, and this was in graduate school, Korean. I was at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, but I was doing field work in Hawaii, and I met Greg Asner, who's a remote sensor and uh, operates an airborne platform. And I, at this time, thought to myself, yeah, I should probably stop measuring trees one at a time with my hands, and it would really be good to measure them with airplanes and satellites. And that was my really gateway into remote sensing. Um, the planet story involves a, at least a couple of happy accidents, but I guess the the short version is after doing science around looking at things like carbon mitigation with forest reforestation projects, I came to the conclusion that the science was pretty baked, we, which is to say we knew how to measure carbon on the Earth's surface pretty well. Um, it's better now. But even 10 years ago, we had really good methodologies and that the policy process was the blocker. Uh, so I went to, to Washington, D.C. to do a AAAS fellowship. Um, and then I got a little bit bored with government work, I suppose. And it was it was at this point in my life, we had a phone call from USAID where I was working with a company called Planet Labs that I had never heard of. And I immediately started asking remote sensing questions on that phone call. I think Andrew was on that call, Crean, And... Uh, I hung up the phone and my colleague who knew I was a little bit unhappy in my job said, you should go work for them. And that was the very first moment in my entire life I had considered working for a private company. Um, everything else had been kind of on a professorial path. Interestingly enough, we have um, a couple of Planet Labs alums on this call, but I won't divert us into uh, uh, introductions. So yeah, so you came to Planet, what year was that? It was late 2014. So I think we were about 80 people. Yeah. And you and I made friends pretty fast. And um, and so what have you been doing at Planet? How's that evolved? You know, the first year was working with a lot of nonprofit organizations um, in places like Nairobi and Bangkok. But uh, those of you who know Planet well, 2014, 2015 was not the peak of our data quality. <laughs> and these users turned out to be limited in their capacity. For instance, a lot of them had not had any experience in remote sensing or GIS. Um, and What's so, the GIS for so people can know? Oh yeah, geographic information systems. So map making. And 
I was, I mean, to be overly honest, I was like getting concerned about showing value to the organization. So I started calling scientists that I knew, earth scientists that I knew. Greg was one of those people. Alessandro was one of those people. Alessandro Pacini's at Woods Hole Research Center. He's got a startup company now. Um, various others and said, hey, we have this kind of strange data set. It's high frequency. We need to work on our image quality. You know, if we get you some data, could you write some scientific studies? Could you evaluate the utility of this data? And that was the origin of what is now called the Educational Research Program at Planet is one of the programs that I manage. And um, I think within a within about four to five months, the very first peer-reviewed paper externally was published using Planet uh, imagery. And now the publication rate is about two papers a day on average. Um, we cleared 500 easily last year. So there's so many being published now we can we we can't read them all. Um, so cool. And this has been, I think, for me personally as a scientist, it's been a an unexpected but delightful situation. Like I sort of feel like we are uh, incentivizing the development of an earth science literature that that would not otherwise exist without Planet. And we're not the ones doing the work largely; it's the users doing it. Um, but it's really exciting to see all the kinds of interesting and innovative ideas that they come up with, a huge number of which I think it's fair to say, Creon, we did not anticipate or perhaps we did not have time to think about <laughs> in the 2014. Yeah, well, I hope you'll have some time to show some slides of some of these use cases. I know you, you kind of wanted to go without slides, but I'm going to encourage you to actually um, show some stuff because you always have great stuff at have the all hands and everything else. Um, I will say this, by the way, this is just an anecdote, but uh, when um, everyone was starting to uh, get less worried about COVID, you know, uh, we had a bunch of meetings on site at Planet. All sorts of people reconverged on the office, our new big offices. And what I noticed, because I was the like wandering person who could wander from meeting to meeting, was that we Planet Labs itself has somewhat become an Earth Science powerhouse. Like you, it was like we were do, running an earth science conference within the planet labs conference. And there were all these people presenting all these topics about different things that they were measuring and different products they were creating for the ecology and earth science uh, communities. Just, uh, anyway, uh, go on. So, um, now, so the education research program at planet, it's actually our, our largest program in some sense, is it not? Roughly 40% to 40, 50%, depending on how you measure it, uh, planet users are university users and the vast majority of those in the education research program. Yeah, it's enormous. Um, and, and even in terms of data throughput, I couldn't put a exact number on it, but you know, it's massive. I met, incidentally, I'm at the University of Copenhagen today on this call. Uh, and so I got to meet uh, Creon, literally 20 PhDs and postdocs all working on planet data. Um, and they have been for years. Um, and they're they're processing through millions of square kilometers of our imagery, publishing papers every month or so. Um, so it was really exciting. Very cool. Um, and uh, do you want to uh, maybe... I mean, you can take it. It's your show here. You can talk about whatever you want, but I do hope you sure. have some, some use cases and some examples of that. Just to be clear on this call, I don't think we've had like an introduction to Planet Labs kind of thing for this audience. Now, some of these people are Planet Labs alums and some of them are my friends. So I'm not sure. And some, we have Steve, he's been associated with Planet since the early days. So I don't actually think we need very much of of uh, intro, intro to planet, come to think of it. Yeah, almost everybody here knows the basics. Um, so maybe um, we could we can skip over that unless you have a particular view you want to. Uh... I would say let's skip, let's skip over that in the interest of time. And why don't I show one example of a bit of a, and it's kind of an exemplar and I think it's on the theme here. And I'll, rather than showing you the slides, I'll, I'll just literally show you the paper. So, this is a bit of a, this is an older one, Creon will remember, but it's yeah. an example of, of a study which was led by external users 
So these are users in the education and research program, Andreas Cobb and Boss Altena. We've known them for years. Um, and you can see here, they're talking about measuring river ice and water velocities with our data. And this will actually give a, it'll, it will serve as a brief introduction to planet. Um, there's some older quantities in here. A lot of these numbers have changed in dimensions and orbital altitudes. But first of all, right away, I mean, Andy and Bas wrote this paper, wrote the majority of this paper, and they, they're the ones who made this figure, which tickled me immediately. They sort of worked all this out on their own, which is pretty common of our external users. So what they're showing is an early planet orbit at 475 kilometers altitude, a sun synchronous orbit. This is similar to Earth observation science orbits for platforms like Landsat and Sentinel and MODIS. And what they've drawn out here is the track of multiple planet dove satellites. And they're highlighting that although at the, at the equator, if things are working kind of the way we want them to, our strips of imagery, you know, in an ideal world would be flush, like you're driving a Zamboni or mowing your lawn or something. But at high latitudes, because the rotation of the earth is slower, these strips overlap. And here they have a diagram of this from 2019 planet imagery. And what they're showing is that although we were billed as imaging every day, everywhere, every day, at this part of the earth, we're collecting multiple images separated by only 90, 80, 100 seconds. And um, this allows them to use the the difference in the movement of, in this case, ice in these high latitude rivers. This is this is um kind of spring thaw in Alaska or northern Canada. I think this one, oh, this is actually in Siberia. Um, so the ice is breaking up as the spring comes to the tundra and boreal region. And then Andy and Boss are able to make a vector field that shows the surface of velocity of the stream and actually measure that surface velocity. Um, so let me let me now point out the, the title of this session, which was from spin-offs to acceptation. And I'll, I'll get to acceptation in a minute. But the coolest part of this story is that when we presented this at Planet, I think Will Marshall like grabbed me by the arm and said, like, that is so cool. And uh, I also had another conversation with someone who said, you know, we were just having a conversation on the space team about um, potentially removing some of this duplicative image capture. So the point is that this was an unforeseen outcome. Now, I don't want to over-engineer that. I mean, it's something that happens with Landsat and Sentinel to a degree. It's not like we discovered plutonium here. But my point is it was not a huge priority for planet at the time to look at these sub daily collects separated by only a minute. Um, but it's a demonstration of an earth science technique that really didn't exist um, before planet and has the potential to reveal hydrological patterns that are really critical when we think about climate change in high latitudes, when we think about even just basic land use management, permafrost management at these latitudes. Um, so it's it's a form of innovative science. I think the the thing I learned, and it's taken me years to kind of get used to learning this, is that it's science that we did not foresee. Um, and and this often seems to be the norm. Um, let me let me say just a couple of things about spinoffs, uh, and I'll I'll stop sharing this for a moment. Can also show other examples and take some questions on this particular example, but. Um, you know, I'm I'm fond of technology that flows out of the space industry as a whole. It's something I pay attention to. I find it really compelling when space technology is innovated in such a way that it flows into other domains. And this often, I think, seems to be the norm rather than the exception. But it's an interesting political commentary, I suppose, and this is just my opinion that we we call that spin-offs. There's a comment, there's a connotation of the word spin-offs that is a bit borderline derogatory, which is to say it's sort of derivative. It's like a 
an after the fact explanation of why we did it in the first place. Um, but a, perhaps a more interesting interpretation of that is acceptation. So acceptation is a word from biology. It's uh, parallel to the word adaptation. And it was coined by Stephen Jay Gould, the, the evolutionary biologist uh, in the roughly early 80s. And the contrast is that in, in evolution, an adaptation is sort of you're fit to a selection pressure. If you're the organism that's undergoing evolution, you adapt because several of your members of your population died, right? Because they had they had poorer, less fit traits to some kind of environmental condition. And so the subsequent generations are therefore adapted to that, to that change. Acceptation, what Stephen Jay Gould was getting at was um, you face a new and different uh, threat, perhaps, or, or stressor from your environment, and you, you happen to have already some kind of biological technology that helps you deal with it. The example that Gould uh, discussed at length is um, feathers on birds, that is to say, uh, avian dinosaurs, that basically feathers it is likely, I mean, we can't know for certain, but it is likely that feathers were an adaptation to stressors related to cold climates and therefore provided warmth as the first reason that they kind of came into the biological world. Did they come and from that, scales? Yes. Yeah. So, and it's sort of, there's a whole realm of kind of skin adaptations that are reptilian looking, right? That protect you from your environment. And then flight was, in Gould's opinion, an acceptation that once these feathers existed, it became possible for flight to evolve. And it might not have happened, um, or at least at least feather-powered flight. There are other flight uh, methodologies, you know, that that different organisms have, like insects and, and bats and stuff. Um, so I kind of, hey, I'm I, pers- I, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you're up twice. Um, one is, I know this is getting a little bit away from space. They were flying dinosaurs without feathers, A. Yep. A different, a different line, though. Pterosaurs are, uh, right. are a cul-de-sac. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then um, the other thing is that I, in terms of exaptation, the one I'm most familiar with, I learned about this concept through John Verveke. It was actually Robbie Shingler who... who got a bunch of us to watch his videos and uh, the acceptation that Verveke talks about, which is absolutely fascinating, is the, is the tongue. So many animals have tongues, including reptiles and ma- all sorts of mammals, yeah. other animals. They all have tongues, even anyway. And those tongues are basically for tasting, determining what's uh, nutritious and what's poisonous. And they're for moving food around in your mouth, getting it ready to swallow and all that stuff. And then humans come along with tongues, just like everybody else doing these things that, that with their tongues moving food around and tasting and sensing and spitting. And, um, and they start to use it. They accept it to, to speak. Is that a correct usage of that acceptation? It is. In biology, it is. And uh, this is also a, a pretty hot buzzword in technology. Let me give an easy technology example. Um, uh, GPUs. So this is a is an oversimplification. We won't have time to go in, into it in, in depth. And I'm I'm not an expert in it to be totally frank. But you know, there's no question that demand for realistic video games throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s was a a sort of selection pressure, if you will, to lead to the innovation of graphics processing units, which is what GPU stands for. And now use GPUs for everything, autonomous vehicles, medical imaging. I mean, you pick any cloud computing thing you want, cryptocurrency, on and on and on. Um, it's an interesting retrospective analysis if you consider, for instance, um, you know, there are plenty of, I think, reasonable uh or at least worthwhile to consider political criticisms of video games in terms of their effects on human psychology and things like that. But uh, I don't know that I've ever seen an interesting like cost benefit analysis, sort of like what did video games 
lead us to with respect to this GPU technology in terms of how it transformed the world economy. Um, and in the at least space technology, you sort of you almost can't do it. I know I know we want to kind of stay away a little bit from spacecraft technology because that's such a common topic here. But you know, if you're gonna take human beings off planet Earth, like first of all, you're gonna you're gonna have to deal with your resource environment in a highly constrained and um deliberate way in this and of course you don't have any fossil fuels to burn or anything like that really so that means you're dealing with solar technology and nuclear technology you're dealing unless with you go carbon. to titan yeah <laughs> but, but you're dealing with uh co2 scrubbers you know we have co2 scrubbers on the space station and in spacecraft and there's there's already it appears and again an area i'm not an expert in where there's there's interesting technology transfer to something like carbon capture and sequestration on earth so I think when we when we look at its hydrological example that we just looked at with planet uh, for Earth science, I see a similar phenomenon. It's I think it's a list, it's a little bit less striking because we're an Earth science and Earth imaging company, and this is an Earth science result. It's not exactly um, a massive lateral, but it is a surprise. It's like an example of a scientific application that was a surprise. It was unplanned, and it was just sort of a happy benefit um, of the way that our orbital mechanics worked out and the way some of the camera timing worked out. The technical question, Joe, which is something you and I have talked about many times and belly ached about at work and relates to your uh, Zoom background as well. Are we now, Do we, have we learned the lesson and now we keep all these images, even if they're only separated by 90 seconds, in our image archive and make them available to those small subset of customers that are interested in such rapid update? I would generalize that we've improved things, um, but it isn't perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so do you have more examples or how do you want to proceed? We've got a couple of questions in the audience, but it's still kind of sparse. Let me, um, I want to show another example, but let me see if I can get this one handy. Uh, I can describe this one. It isn't too much. Oh, here we go. Okay. So this is, a this is semi related to the same, um, orbital mechanics and camera timing thing that we saw. So let me take you back to early 2021. We're looking at some planet images in Uttarakhand, which is northern India. And what you're going to see is we're toggling between two images. These were both captured on the same day. So this is a, a similar phenomenon. It happens to be at a, at a lower latitude, but we basically captured images, in this case, 28 minutes apart. And what you're seeing in the valley floor here, this is an aerosol cloud that accompanied a massive landslide that killed 200 people. There's a couple of hydroelectric installations up here. Uh, there's one over here you can see pretty well. The second image, by the way, is not so great. This is kind of image that was an early SuperDove image where we've made a lot of improvements. But essentially, off the screen, a gigantic chunk of rock and ice broke off a mountainside in Uttarakhand and created a mass flow landslide moving at I think over 100 miles an hour, and it flowed down this valley floor. Um, the analysis of this aerosol cloud's motion, and, and uniquely possible because we happened to collect multiple images on this day, uh, allowed a group of researchers led by Dan Sugar at University of Calgary uh, to analyze and determine at initially, they thought this was a they thought this was what is called a glacial lake outburst flood, a, a GLOF. Um, but the planet images, as well as other images of this region, allowed them to determine that it was in fact uh, just a piece of rock and ice, like more like a proper landslide, and that it was frictional heating of the fall depth or or distance that turned this into a kind of wet. Uh, like slurry um, that caused this landslide to be so destructive. Um, 
So it's it's another interesting one where you know we set the bar at getting to an image every day for every place every day. But in the effort to get there, and I do want to talk about this. I want to talk about goalposts and how they motivate technological innovation and the evolution of technology itself. You know, we set a very clear target of we have to get to one image per day of the surface of the earth. In in service of getting to that target, we ended up with, as we just saw in the earlier example, a lot of intraday or sort of multiple images on the same day. Um, and here we have yet another example of the like critical scientific benefit, in this case, a benefit that allows us to understand a fatal disaster and potentially, in the words of Dan Sugar, um, the scientist who led this work, you know, innovate and improve the way we do landslide warning and landslide mitigation. So. Great example. Got any more for us? I, I would. Well, At 500 a, papers a year. Yeah, yeah. There's so many. I, I, this, this would get, we would be in danger of this turning into a, a sort of typical Joe University seminar. Um, but I'm curious if, um, let me, uh, I, let me, let me pose a, um, let me pose perhaps an argument to the group about this phenomenon. Uh, there is a narrative. It's a political narrative right now, I think, but there's a narrative that, um, space exploration, uh, this is, I want to be care, I want to be cautious with this. There's a narrative that space exploration is sort of damaging or deleterious to our efforts to mitigate climate change. Um, the narrative goes kind of like rockets are big CO2 emitters, which is not not true, uh, although acutely they are for an individual flight, but they're a very tiny fraction of carbon emissions. There's, of course, tech billionaires who aren't always the most climate friendly folk uh, in the political sphere. Right, even if they make EV companies. Yeah, exactly. And and one of the things that I I sort of foresee, and I wonder what the space industry will do as a whole industry is a is a sort of a, I'll call it a risk, um, a business risk associated with the ever expanding kind of footprint of the whole global space industry. Which is to say, as rocket flights increase, you know the the way that looks to the general public is like a lot of carbon emission. And it is of interest to me that most of the modern rockets we're talking about, or at least some of the key new rockets are um, methane and liquid oxygen mixtures, meaning that, you know, methane is their principal propellant. Um, this sets up a scenario, which is interesting. I think it explains, uh, a carbon captured prize that Elon launched um, not too long ago, where carbon capture and sequestration could theoretically be conducted as a exercise on Earth in order to fuel rockets departing Earth or even going to, to low Earth orbit. And even if this was a political gesture, um, it has an interesting prospect of generating seriously useful technological benefits, these exaptations on the premise that in order to solve, say, manufacturing your own methane from Earth's atmosphere to fuel a starship, for instance, or, uh, or a new Glen, you, you know, put a lot of engineers and smart people together in a room and they figure out some interesting technologies that, that turn out to have an immediate benefit in terms of terrestrial carbon capture and sequestration, which is to say carbon capture and sequestration for climate mitigation itself. This is this is kind of the the existential question I think in my opinion the space industry might think about which is could it reframe itself as part of a climate solution? Um are you seriously thinking that the methane to fuel these rockets is going to come from car capture uh, uh, atmospheric capture whether it's CO2 or methane? I mean the methane is just going to come from natural gas, right? It is and it will initially, but again even as a demo, even as an exercise, um, there is an atmosphere processing unit at the facility in Texas. I don't, you know, I don't have any insight as to what the future of that unit is, but there's at least been some speculation that it might be used to do oxygen capture or other type of atmospheric gas manipulation in order to produce propellants. 
Um, so that's, uh, again, again, got any, in, Steve, you got any inside dope for us? <laughs> no, but it, yeah, I mean, it's, there are wells on property. Um, the question is whether they can tap them and, and then longer term, of course, the statement is it's going to be, um, you know, a, a carbon neutral launch program is the plan. So we'll see. Okay. I mean, it's obviously a drop in the bucket compared to bogs and everything else outgassing in the permafrost. So um, while important everywhere to tap it down, it's it's kind of a drop in the bucket compared to- Well, stuff we're planet, yeah. planet will have its tanager fleet flying and we'll yeah. be able to sniff out all these exactly i mean i am i cannot wait to see what cattle yards look like compared to other areas and 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 i and a scary thing i heard from some folks who focus their entire career on methane emissions is that for reasons unknown to us um bogs peat bogs in particular are outgassing methane like never before so some microbial shift might be underway that's truly scary we got any paper, got yeah. any, paper any papers on that joke uh, we do actually have a few studies that have looked at, first of all, the, I mean, actually, Steve, we have probably 50 that are dealing with um, permafrost changes in high latitudes. Permafrost um, melting, there's a, there's a phrase here, permafrost uh, slumps are a huge infrastructure threat, um, and they are uh, uniquely monitorable with our data. Um, there have been a few people sleuthing around to look for those uh, kind of sort of more explosive outgassing events that we don't really fully understand, these kind of detonations that have happened in at least a few clickbaity uh, stories on the intertubes. But um, um, the closest the closest thing is measurements of water surface area as it fluctuates in very high time series data with from planet and modeling, and it is modeling, not measurement, but modeling the water surface behavior into estimates of methane emissions. Um, Kelly Hundula is one person I know who has worked on that. And she is now, I believe, at Arizona State University. She's been using our data for many years. I think Mike also had his hand up. OK, let's go for Mike. Mike Grace. I also just wanted to say that um, with respect to sort of public perception and um i mean the we, we don't remember this but the apollo programs were not wildly popular in fact they were broadly lampooned at the time um and that it was uh kind of like a, a significant amount of political will on leadership's part and pressure from uh competition with the russians that really drove it and not popular opinion certainly not the left um, it was seen as enormously wasteful to put some clowns on the moon. Um, and, um, you know, that changed significantly afterwards. And I, I think that it's probably not wise to pay too much attention to fluctuations in public opinion driven by Twitter, generally speaking. <laughs> and um, to the degree well, as, that... As Priyan knows, I'm 100% off Twitter. Mike, I love your question. And it, it leads me to a point I definitely wanted to make today. So I, I'm a climate scientist, uh, as an ecologist, right? I don't study the climate system per se, but I study the ecological consequences of changes to the climate system. I want to read you a quote from a book. And yes, uh, Creon, this is a really good one, I think. Um, it's by George Marshall. It's called Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change. It's a book about the psychology of the climate problem. And Although he never makes, at least as far as I could tell, the direct comparison between, say, trying to solve climate change and the Apollo program or trying to solve climate change and go to Mars. Here's what he says is what is wrong with the climate uh, effort. He says it's so open to multiple meanings and interpretations. It provides us with none of the defining qualities that would give it a clear identity no deadlines, no geographic locations, no single cause, solution, or enemy our brains constantly scanning for the cues that we need to process and categorize information, find none, and we are left grasping for air. Now, um, many people have attempted to make analogies between trying to solve the climate problem and the Apollo program or going to Mars, but I wanted to make one that I think has been under 
under discussed. Um, and Mike, you just you really just articulated it actually. Um, like planet's mission to image the whole Earth every day, SpaceX's mission to get to Mars is is whatever people think about it. It is very clear. You know what I'm saying. The finish line is uh, not ambiguous. Now, now, whatever happens if they get there how it happens, whether people are skeptical, all that kind of stuff will probably ensue. But there is a crystallized kind of defining quality of success um, that is understandable kind of before it happens and as it happens. And Marshall, this this uh, psychologist would argue, I think, that that's a very favorable problem-solving psychology to be in. And again, as an ecologist and a climate scientist, I see a very unfavorable psychology and problem solving environment when we do, when we look at climate change by by contrast yeah you um, know i i, I want to also say with respect to the apollo program i think that it was competition with the russians that actually was the psychologically unifying and clear goal that people could understand and coalesce around not amorphous kind of carl sagany you know space is awesome which i very much love um, well but Okay, Mike, but, you know, and I'm sure many of you have heard this before. I mean, if you read up on the personalities who were running the Apollo program, uh, in their own words, uh, they don't talk that much about the Russians because, quite frankly, they weren't even privy to a lot of the hard-won knowledge that the West had on the Russians' progress, like the explosion of the, N the explosions of the N1 and stuff like that. But what they did know was they had this president who they loved, who had committed to send humans to the moon and return them safely to Earth before the decade was out. And then when he was assassinated, there was this feeling that, that like, we owed it to him. Yeah, and but I, I, I think, so Mike, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with you about the, the structural motivations of Apollo, but I think it's clear that the public sentiment grew and, and ultimately exceeded, if you will, the mandate that it, it, at least in some parts of global culture, not all, um, I think it, it's fair to say it, it transcended sort of the, the Cold War military industrial objective. Um, and I'm not a, I'm not a going to pass myself off as an Apollo historian. Um, but, but it's worthwhile to think about, you know, when we talk about I'm no joke. When we talk about winning against climate change, do we know enough about what that would actually feel like? I mean, it's difficult for me to imagine us popping champagne bottles and celebrating success against climate change because I think the finish line is ambiguous. Well, you can, it, I agree, Joe, and we don't need to get too far into the climate change weeds here, but I mean, I, just to back up what you're saying, it's very interesting. We could, we could imagine a time in the not too distant future uh, when global consumption of fossil fuels and global CO2 emissions have actually started to decline, which they are not. Uh, in the West, they've been declining for some time. But we can imagine this world, and I mean, we can put aside whether anyone's going to have uh, heat for their homes or electricity for their cars in such a world, but maybe they will. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Or diesel for their ships and trains and whatever but but we can imagine that let's like oh we bent the curve on co2 it's like meh you know is the world getting to be a better place already or you know and the other thing about it is you know you or you can have some sort of crazy like it's the same problem like you can say well we're trying to do this for our great great grandchildren you know so like well, that means we're never going to measure it in our lifetimes. So that's too bad. Yeah, it's, I mean, in Creon, I think what I'm sort of arguing here is that not all, but some elements of, say, the effort to put humans on Mars, there are, there are more things than technology that could be exacted from that example is kind of my point that, um, you know, Marshall has a very psychologically strong case that that optimism is is missing in climate discussions. And it's 
so, you know, I, I guess an interesting contrast for this group to consider might be, for instance, uh, you know, nuclear power is not the greatest example in every circle, but you could you could quite easily imagine a country or a state, um, you know, declaring that they were going to become carbon neutral by an absurdly early date, uh, like say within five years or ten years, and that their plan to do it was to you know build X number of power plants that would be required to do so. And I think those kinds of challenges, like X Prize style challenges, could shift um, or or accelerate the optimism around tackling it in a way that leverages some of the same type of optimism that you see um, around SpaceX or that you saw around certain portions of the of the Apollo program. Uh, so it's more of a it's a policy prescription expectation. It's like, did the Apollo program actually kind of invent something that's interesting from a global psychological perspective? Um, you know, and sort of by accident, right? Because the, the 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 effort was really about beating the Russians from a presidential level, but it, in order for it to succeed, it had to build this kind of more cohesive political momentum. Yes. Well. Okay. Look, I think that it's time for us to um, move to audience questions uh, in the remaining ten minutes, or if we can go over a few minutes, else, and that's another question uh, because we started late. Uh, but before we do, I'm going to invoke speaker's privilege and just give one uh, capstone on this Apollo stuff. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about Apollo was, um, I think it was the, a couple years ago, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. Um, and uh, it's a guy who, you know, you may have loved him, hate him, or never heard of him. I listen to him several times a week. John Podhoritz on the commentary podcast, commentary magazine podcast. And he said... He said, it was about the Cold War, but it wasn't about the Cold War. What it was really about was what a group of people can do when they set their minds together to achieve a goal and work with vigor and competence and support and unity in order to achieve it. That's what it's really about. It's a triumph for the human race. That can be exapted. Like the fact that you can achieve great things, you know, and reach for the stars and all this kind of stuff, that's the, that's the thing. But as you point out, the goalposts have to be well-defined. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, <clears throat> we have this question from Sylvia. You know, good Sylvia's still on the line, all the way from Africa. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can see, Sylvia wants to know, if planet constellation can be used to study atmospheric gravity waves. And you have to make the distinction between gravity waves and gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are detected by these interferometer things. And, but gravity waves, you can maybe describe, they're a meteorological thing, are they not? I would love a better explanation of gravity waves in the atmosphere. This is something, this is a phrase I have not heard. If you're talking oh. about like if you're talking about laminar sort of fluidic effects of the yes atmosphere. yes yeah. the gravity waves are like what glider pilots use yeah you know um I I'm gonna hazard yes uh, but it's just a hypothesis um, certainly if they're carrying moisture like I've certainly seen those kinds of effects in clouds with moisture but if if we're talking about um, you know transparent atmosphere um, possibly uh. Let me give an analogy. There is a there is a, a person at JPL, and I'm blanking on his name at this moment, um, who is looking at uh, ocean surface conditions. So these kinds of sun sun glint effects that occur due to slight differences in salinity or temperature in terms of ocean surface currents, and that work turns out to benefit from planets imaging in, in kind of unpredictable ways, one of which is that there's some stochasticity in the pointing accuracy of our satellites. So you get a diverted kind of diversity of nadir angles. Um, in the atmosphere, I'm going to speculate that that phenomenon might theoretically be observable in transparent atmosphere if you are able to observe it from multiple places, either simultaneously or near simultaneously. Um, 
but that's just a hypothesis. Yeah, it's a okay. kind. Of, I think the answer to that question is is maybe, and we'll have to do, figure it out. Um, and is it not also the case, Joe? And I don't know if you have these examples at your fingertips, but this whole sun glint on the ocean surface example. Didn't we have another one of these surprises where someone used um, planet data, many images of like some river delta or something like this, and by looking at the glinting off the waves and doing statistics over many, many images, they were able to recreate uh, bathymetric uh, information about the the sea, the subsea surface yeah. and what was this, going on under the water. This one is worth showing for just a few seconds, because I know we have some other questions, because it was wild. So Murray Ford led this. He's another one of these users from the early days. Um, he's looking at this harbor in New Zealand. This was just a white paper. I don't know if he ever even published this in a peer-reviewed journal, but here's what he did. He looked at this harbor, and he just took the mean of the surface reflectance of the Earth and planet data across a long time series. So these are not real waves. These are the average at this pixel is white because there's a white cap more often than there's just clear water, right? And here's a median, here's standard deviation. This is an index called breaking wave fraction. Um, but then he's able to turn this into this, that from one calendar year to the next, you can see the changes in the bathymetry of this harbor by the by the surface movements of these breaking waves um, in the in the aggregate. This is compelling because these are at depths that planet does not visually penetrate to, which is to say you cannot see the bottom in our imagery. This is sort of like a uh, an after image, if you will, of a of a ground effect that is not directly observed by the spacecraft. It's also uh, dare, I, dare I endorse my own theme a little too much? I could call this an acceptation of another method in, in ecology and vegetation that we use, which is analysis of phenology. Phenology is the rhythm of vegetation or, or life. So it could be autumn colors. For example, we see flowering trees in our imagery. And there's a concept now in the literature called pixel phenology, where the word originally means changes in life. In the context of this work by Murray Ford, it simply means changes in the Earth's surface at a place over time, some seasonal kind of change. Um, and this concept of pixel phenology is now really widely used in Earth science to look at places of the Earth that are arid, that are that are almost devoid of, of you know, vegetation or other life forms for things like mineralogy and obviously here, uh, geomorphology. Cool. Let's see. Uh, anyone else want to ask a question? I, I, I guess that was... Yes. Really Okay. We had a hand up earlier today from Jonathan. I don't know if it's still. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was. I mean, I just wanted to ask about the uh, um, the, this idea of using uh, planet data archivally, uh, because um, we, you know, I work on the on the. For those who don't know me, I, I'm an astronomer and I work on the Chandra X-ray Observatory, uh, and we've been we've got 25 years of archival astronomy data. And what we find is that there are now, for a typical observation, five times as many papers written archivally as from uh, versus the uh, uh, the person who originally requested the observation and wanted to go get it. It's a little different, right? In that we're targeted observations rather than you know you're you're essentially in, intrinsically an archival mission. But it just you know it speaks to the importance of people coming along and finding new uses for existing data. And as the person who has to make sure we have the right metadata in the, <laughs> in the data, it's, it's really, um, a, you have to be a lot more careful to design the archive and to design the metadata in the archive to support unexpected uses than you do expected uses. And so finally getting my question, which is, you know, how much has Planet thought about that, and and to what extent uh, are you um, sort of explicitly adding extra context, extra metadata to to uh, support new uses of the data? What a great question! I certainly think we could do more, but I would 
kind of jump out of my chair to agree with you, uh, which is to say the value of the archive data is not, not fully predictable and could increase suddenly in a particular region. Um, there's a very recent article about the tracking of this Chinese balloon not too long ago. It's a public article um, uh, work featuring some planet imagery and the uh, essentially the, the fact that we had the archive in this case only a few weeks or, or months um, turned out to be useful, very useful in understanding the trajectory of that balloon and some of the balloon sites, the balloon deployment sites. Um, a more general example, Jonathan, uh, and one that has proven, I think, exquisitely valuable to planet product line and business strategy is that, how do I do this quickly? Uh, the, the many iterations of planet hardware, as you, I'm sure you're, many of you are accustomed to our, our agile aerospace, one of the consequences of that is, I mean, if you're going to iterate on a, on a camera, mm -hmm. continuity from one version to the next is sort of the very thing you're trying not to do, if you will, right? You're trying to make the camera better. So you don't want it to be perfectly uh, identical, right, to, to past cameras. And the the production of a diversity of sensors uh, in this kind of steady iterative improvement, themselves also high in number. So not just a number of versions, but number of satellites in, in a particular version, you know, like version 10 or version 11 has X number of satellites. Um, this, this changed Earth observation science uh, fundamentally. What it did was it, it put, uh, an innovation pressure, a selection pressure on earth scientists to figure out how to stabilize after the fact, the uh, surface reflections or top of atmosphere radiance observations, the actual measurements of the camera um, over these many generations of hardware, which is to say they, they were incentivized to build algorithms to sort of bring all of this archival data into natural, into alignment with itself. Um, what I'm describing, there are many versions of it, so I don't want to point to only one, but one of them is a, a planet product's been publicly announced in development called Fusion. And one of the people leading that effort is, uh, is one of these users that we, that we talked about already on this call, which is to say it was an external user to planet producing something that we did not direct and, and I think did not fully anticipate in terms of its importance. So, right. But, but then we, then we, we, uh enticed him to come work for us and lead a team to exactly. uh, commercialize that product. Yeah. I want to mention one thing before we run out of time. This person, Jared, is, are they still on the line? Oh, they seem to have left. Okay, then I don't have to answer their question. Well, this person, Jared, was saying, save everything, save everything, and ending each of his messages with save everything, and just... That's Jared. me. I'm here. Oh, there, there you are, Jared. No, definitely. Hey, hey. I'm a computer guy. And okay, uh, I well, the insiders so you should uh, save everything. It's so cheap. Well, well, uh, our 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 Google Cloud uh, bills are not so cheap. Well, that's we, because you use yeah. Google Cloud. Now I don't do any of that. When I decide I'm going to use an initiative, I build a server and get some co-location, half a rack, quarter rack. You could put yeah, yeah. a lot of hard drive in a small. We're bringing down. We're bringing down dollars a month. Yeah, yeah, we're bringing down a lot of stuff. So we're bringing down well, ten overpriced. We're bringing down ten terabytes a day. And but my point I, was not. I that. ran online games, Crayon. I, I'm I'm familiar with terabyte data sites. I ran online games for millions of users. So yes, okay. I'm familiar with the kind of sizes. Well, let me just say that the arguments about you know lazy evaluation and on demand and stuff like this is is a whole other topic. But but we are required by law to save everything. Actually, we are required by law, as I understand it, but by our uh, regulatory licensing to um, whatever we send down to earth from the satellites, we have to save a copy of it. Now, as for the- I, I understand the law and I understand the requirements, but oftentimes law and requirements don't translate into reality. So- Well, they do it for us. We, we have to do it. <laughs> That's what would happen. It's okay. okay. I'm, not, I'm not pointing any fingers. See? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Alison, we're, we're at the hour. Uh, is there any, you want to do your final questions or how about that? Yes. 
My final Prozac question is always, if everything goes well, perfectly with your current work, where do you think we could be in five to 10 years? Leave us with a bit of an existential hope vision for what that could look like. What would you really love to do? And if everything goes right, maybe able to do in five to 10 years. Wow. Uh, I think a kind of a mission control for the earth is a concept I've always liked. Um, you know, there's this beautiful little sentence in the Kim Stanley Robinson book that is a happy accident itself of, of him visiting planet and kind of um, getting to know us a little bit, where he talks about planet's existence, I think, in the year 2312. So my first hope is that planet's still around 300 years from now. Um, and but he also talks about, you know, there's there's certainly a community, a consensus around you know, the, the population, like we, we should get more than weather reports every day, I guess would be a good way to phrase it. You know, it'd be great to live in a world where we could see the fluxes and stocks of carbon in ecosystems in a real time or near real time way, where we could see threats to biodiversity unfolding like before our eyes, where we have an opportunity to take action immediately. Um, we could sort of go on and on, but I think, you know, this kind of vision of a community, a global community kind of coming together around data, uh, testing that data, evaluating that data, rigorously peer reviewing that data as a, as a community, this kind of ministry of the future, to borrow another phrase from Kim Stanley Robinson, is a really compelling notion. So I suppose um, we can't put that all on the earth science community. There's a lot of decision makers and other actors and commercial entities that have to be involved, and we're working on that as well. But um, that would certainly be my you know, my personal desire to see planet get to. All right. Well, thanks, thanks. Joe. It's been great. And thanks, Allison, for um, making this all happen. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. Thank you all. Yeah. This is really fun for me. I really appreciate it. Uh, Creon, Allison, uh, Lydia, I appreciate your, your work on the back end to get this together. Okay. We will see you all next time. And uh, feel free to suggest other people because it's, it's fun to have a... a, a a big group, but this, this group is great. I pre thanks for coming. Bye for now.